Hey, this is Matt. I'm the lead pastor of Westminster Baptist Church. Thanks for engaging God's word with us. My prayer for you is that this would be supplemental to your discipleship journey. Uh, if we can connect you with a local church or a discipleship group, uh, please contact us at info at discoverwbc.com. on our side, Father. You're fighting those battles for us, and we praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen and amen. You can be seated. 
We are going to be in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31 this morning. I hope you will join us there. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. And again, I just want to celebrate church with you, Miss Emma, and the work that God is doing in her life. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. That is so cool. I love celebrating a new life in Jesus Christ. That is why we do what we do. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father... Who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, as it is in heaven. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Acts chapter 4, there's a miracle, there's a trial, and then they go back and they're like, hey, let's pray. Let's pray. And what they do is they gather together a big group and they all pray in unison at one time the same prayer. I think it's so cool. And what you did just now is you prayed in unison one prayer that the Lord taught the disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This praise to God. And what happens here in Acts chapter 4, we're going to see this transition. What happens here is I think the disciples go into their default. When you, when you man, miracle is like on high. It's like, man, this was awesome. Uh, in Christ Jesus' name, we're uh, doing his work in the community. But then there's this trial and it's like, are they going to be in jail? Are they going to be killed? What's going to happen for their faith? And then they go to the Lord in prayer, just like you just did. The disciples go to their default, which is to pray to their king. Read with me, verse 23. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For, in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assemble together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. In trials and temptations, pray. I want you to walk away from today knowing this, and I think it's just a reset. It's like, it's like actually shifting up our default. You got to go back to the default. You got to change it up, and you got to recognize what is your default. When you face a trial or temptation, what is your default? Where do you go? Do you go me or do you go master? Okay, so I want you to notice a couple things. It says in verse 24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together, which is what I just said. You get together, and it's like, hey, here's my trial. Here's my temptation. Let's pray. And it's in unison. It's almost like, man, when you get together with the people that you love and when you care about, it's like this unison of like, man, God, you change this. We can't. And so notice what they say. It says their voices together to God and said, master. And just stop there. Master. I think default, we have to ask the question, is your default me or is your default master? Like, what is my default to go to? Do I go, master, my God, I need your help? Or do I go, me, I can fix this, I can do this. And I think many of you out there are like me, I've shared this before, I'm a doer, I'm a fixer. If my wife needs something fixed, she comes to me, I'm gonna fix it. Like I, that's my natural default. It's what I do. So sometimes that carries over to my emotional life, my spiritual life, my psychological life, my physical, every, every aspect of my life, it transfers over into that. And I'm like, well, how do I fix this? Me. But the first thing they say is master it's a recognition that there's someone outside of us that has control. In fact, the next few words are this. You are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. It's going, okay, I did not create this. My God did. I, if, if I'm on earth with trouble, then let's go to the one who created the earth that I'm living in. Right? I've got this TV. And uh, it's... Uh, 
you know, it's a pretty big TV. Somebody gave it to us, uh, water damage on it. And so half of it works and half of it doesn't. Uh, yeah, awesome, beautiful. Funny thing is this though, because you know ministry, like in our poverty early on in ministry, like even half a screen was better than what we had, right? Literally the half screen was bigger than the one that we had before. I can show you and prove it to you. It's downstairs. Um, but anyways, the controller didn't work to this thing. It was just a terrible TV, right? Like you literally could, we, uh, my grandpa for graduating my doctorate gave me a new TV and we put it up and we were like, oh, that's what it looks like on this side of the TV show. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's so funny. But the controller never worked for that thing. And I don't know about y'all, but I get really frustrated with controllers. Like I'm a techie guy, I know technology, but for some reason I cannot figure out remote controls. If you ever pick one of those things up, it's like, okay, here's how you set them, which I don't know why there's not like some universal rule to how to set remotes, right? Somebody come up with this, you're gonna make billions. Why is there not some universal rule? But anyways, you get the remote out, it's like, hey, if you can press these 16 buttons at once and then click them five times, and you're like, five times? Why can't I just click it twice? Like, I'm sure, you know, five times fast. And I feel like I had to get my, like, toes involved and everything involved. I'm like, oh, just, like, work. And uh, I never can get the remote control to work. Well, this particular TV, uh, the remote control didn't work, and you couldn't program any other remote control to work. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like, and I, th I thought about this, I'm like, I feel like the TV. I'm broken. I got water damage. I got issues in my life, right? Like we all got issues in our life that we wrestle with and fight in our daily lives, do we not? Do you? I can't even get this thing to work. Look, I got problems right now. <laughs> These are super frustrating. The first time I preached at Five Stone Church, like seven years ago, eight years ago, it looked like this the whole time I preached. I'm not kidding. I'll figure it out. We'll get this together. I'm a broken TV and sometimes I feel like I need a controller that works. Amen? I need something just to tell me what to do. Mute. <laughs> like, that's probably most often. <laughs> Mute me, right? Yeah, anyways, turn me up because I'm being silent when I should be preaching. Mute me. You know, I, so many times in my life, I feel like I just need a controller that works, but I'm like that broken TV. You know, it's like, I can fix myself. I got this, right? So much of me is messed up, but yeah, I need somebody outside of me to control and to tell me what to do and when I need to do it. So it's that recognition. Master. You are the one who created me. You are the one who created the heavens and the earth. Master, like you guide me in this life. You're the ones who created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. And if you created all those things, then you can control me, master. How many times in your trial or your temptation that you're struggling today have you just said, God, I give you complete control? And look, let me tell you something. I've discovered this in my life. And this is not to say that I don't fight and battle and struggle. You yeah, ask my wife. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, but there's so many times in my life where I've asked, God, take this from me. That's not, I don't think that's the right question or the right request. I think there's a difference between take this from me and God control me. There's a big difference. One, one is take the temptation from me so that I don't have to face it. The other is, God, lead me through the temptation so that I can overcome it. There's a difference there, right? You're always going to face trials and temptations. You think, if you think if you can just get rid of one temptation, everything will be fine, there will be another temptation sneak in there. If you think you can just come through one trial and everything will be fine, there will be another trial come in there. Amen? What we're finding out is not how to beat one temptation. We're finding out how to be an enduring persevering, fighting battles day after day. And ultimately we say, master. Verse 25, you said through the Holy Spirit by the mouth of our father, David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. I got to this part, and I'm studying. I'm just like working verse through verse. I'm not looking at the commentaries because I just want to study what the Word of God says. I got to this point, and I was like, I just started hearing things, and I was like, in the text, and I was like, this sounds so much like what Jesus taught them to do. This sounds like Jesus teaching the disciples to pray. So back up with me. Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. Our Father, Master, 
Hallowed be thy name. You are the one who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. You, you can see it's like praise, prayer to God, saying who he is and what he does. It's recognizing through worship that he is the master, he is the father. This is literally what Jesus taught them to do. And so I'll go back to that word default. What's your default? This is what Jesus taught them to do, and it's what they went to when they were in a trial or a temptation. And I think it's a great model for us and a question for you. When you're in a trial or a temptation, is your default to go to the Lord's Prayer, how he taught us to pray, Master, not me, Master. And so I'm working through it, and I'm like, okay, this, yeah, it's starting to sound, make sense, because you're like, thy kingdom come. And I thought about this. Look at what he's portraying here. Look at what... Luke is telling us from this story. You've got Romans and their leaders, the people of Rome and their leaders. You've got Israelites and their leaders, and they're all against the people of God. You've got two kingdoms against the kingdom of God. And when I think about thy kingdom come, right? Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? It means not Roman kingdom come. It means not Israelite kingdom come. It's not, it means not Matt's kingdom come. It means not our America kingdom come. It means your kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. And so when I look at this, verse 26, look at it. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. Not the kings of the earth, not the rulers assembled, but thy kingdom come. Even just to clarify, he says, for in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, like to set it up even more, like look at the kingdoms that are against them. Look at what is against them. But thy kingdom come. And look how it shifts into verse 28. To do whatever your hand and your will have predestined to take place. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Man, I love it. Like, it's literally portraying exactly what Jesus taught them to do. All these kingdoms are against us, but not them. Your kingdom. Your hand, your will, predestined for us to do. You know, it's in these trials and these temptations. Like I said, it's so often we just go to me. And again, it's not... It's not wrong to say, God, take this temptation from me. But we have to remember that Jesus was tempted. We have to remember these seasons of temptation as it's not wrong to go through seasons of temptation. So I've been thinking about this, and it's like we often ask ourselves this question. It's it's probably the most common question Pastor Glenn and Pastor Bill and I get. Why is God doing this to me? Why is God letting this happen to me? And I've always thought, like, we've got to answer that. Like, we've got to defend against it. You know, but then I thought... I'm like reading this passage and I'm like, that's actually a good question. Instead of thinking about like, why is God hurting me with this? What if I thought about it like this? What is God doing in my life to grow me? How is my God taking me through this? Instead of why is God doing this to me? I think the better question is why in the world is God with me through it? Why did he choose to come down into my mess and walk with me through it? So let me ask you a question. You can respond audibly. Do you believe, um, unless you say no and then don't respond audibly. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Share with me later. Um, do you believe that Jesus, God the Father, sent his son to die on a cross, raised from the dead, so that you might be free of sin and raised to walk in life like Emma just experienced? Do you believe that God the Father sent his son, Jesus, to do that? Yes. Okay. God sent his son to die on a cross, to endure suffering, to endure persecution. And look what it says. It says, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. This doesn't surprise God. The cross doesn't surprise God. And I don't think our trials and our temptations are surprising God. I don't think he's like, man, why did I do that to them? Oops. <laughs> Whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. Now, the hard problem is this. Some of these things are extremely difficult. There's people in this room who are walking through seasons that I would never want anybody to experience and to endure, right? Some of you are hurting. I think the beauty of the gospel is this. I've said it last week and I'll say it again. God came down off the mountain into the valley. 
to walk with us through the valley that we might not be alone. I think the question is this, why is God allowing me to go through this with him? Why do I deserve that in the midst of a valley, which we're all gonna face, why do I deserve that the God of the universe stepped into my valley and walked with me? It's a really good question to ask because hell was always gonna be here. We were always gonna experience death and sin and frustration because I exist. And if I exist, hell exists because I sin, right? So if that's gonna exist, why did my God come down to me and walk with me through hell? Why did he walk with me through temptation? Why did he walk through me, with me through suffering? Why did he endure pain in this world? Why did he do whatever the father told him to? Because he loves me. And because he cares about you. And because when it says thy kingdom come and thy will be done, thy kingdom is better and thy will is better. This weekend I got to do a wedding for a former student of mine. I spent five years with this kid. I love him to death. His name's Braylon. He was an intern here at WBC, a good friend of mine, and I'm so excited for his life. Um, I I got to lead him towards to Christ, um, baptize him, and now I've got to marry him. I got to lead his wife to Christ, baptize her, and marry her to him, and it's just unbelievable being able to watch that. Like, talking about humbling standing in front of my former church, marrying these two off and seeing what God is doing in their life. Unbelievable experience. But the breakfast before, I sat down with these two. Love them to death. They're probably watching the live stream, so give me grace. But I'm going to share your story. I said, where y'all going on your honeymoon? Because I'm pumped for them, right? And they said, uh, we're going to go up to Big Bend, Texas. We're going to go to the Grand Canyon. Then we're going to go up to Wyoming, go through some... um, Uh, national parks up there. It's going to be beautiful. And then we're going to try to get into Canada if they'll let us because of all the precautions. I was like, that's awesome. And they're like, yeah, we're going to 12 days and we're going to camp the whole time. I said, oh, (laughs) okay. I said, this is what I said. I said, if you can make it through 12 days camping together and traveling that far, you're going to make it. You are going to make it, baby, (laughs) all the way. 12 days camping together. So I looked at Braylon, which Braylon's a good friend of mine. Some of you in here know Braylon. Braylon is an avid gamer and loves to watch soccer and baseball. Braylon is not a camper. I said, Braylon, how many times you been camping? He said, I've been once. I said, okay. I said, Carmen, how many times have you been camping? She said, I've never been camping. Okay. I said, keep me on speed dial and call me. Oh my goodness. And so it clicked in my head. I was like, wow, like five years, you know, in the, in the investing in them. But I, I clicked back to these times and look, Alethea and Paul, you're in here. So I would not affirm this for student ministry anymore. But one thing I did was I took my students, my, my young men who were growing into godly men, and I took them camping, right? So we went to Oklahoma, to the middle of nowhere because we can't just go camping 10 miles away. Matt doesn't like to do that. I want to go to nowhere where it's dangerous. So we went, (laughs) yeah, terrible ideas. I took the lead pastor's son with me. Man, don't take Brecken anywhere dangerous, y'all. But I did it. So um, I go with these students and we go to Oklahoma and it's an awesome place in Oklahoma, right? Like this is a really cool place. Um, But you got to hike seven miles in which is already difficult <laughs> for the kids. And we got to go seven miles in. There's no service. Uh, there's no people. You can only have one group in this whole place at a time. I'm not kidding. We're talking like hundreds and thousands of acres of just canyons. Like it's so cool. And then trees and water. It's beautiful. But you can only have one group at a time. So there's nobody around. You know, what could go wrong? Like, this is smart. Um, And I'm taking guys who have literally never gone camping before. So we're in Oklahoma, nobody around us, no cell phone service. We, We get ready for bed, we go to sleep, and I wake up in the middle of the night, and I'm not kidding you. If you've heard this story, I'm not joking. Smoke everywhere. I woke up, and I could not see in front of me. We didn't have a fire. There's no, it's Oklahoma, y'all. It doesn't even get cold there. There's no fire. So I'm like, why is there fire everywhere? 
So we don't have service. We don't have anything. My only thought was like, look on the back side of the canyon. So I go look on the back side of the canyon. Can't see anything again. All there is is smoke for as far as you could see. But you can't like see much of anything. Uh, the only thing you could have was like sometimes the smoke would like kind of settle down on the ground. You could see over it. And all you saw was smoke in the whole distance as far as I could see. And so I get back and within, I'm not kidding, within 15 minutes to 30 minutes, it was complete white out, sn- smoke everywhere, couldn't see anything. I've got five teenagers with me. Is this true? I've got five and I did not know what to do in this situation because we're on top of a canyon and we've got to walk down back into the valley, smoke everywhere. So here's what I did. I strapped a flashlight onto the front and back of each one of the students. And all I did was I said, just follow me. And so I go down this mountain, literally had never been to this place in my life. I'd never hiked there, never camped there, nothing. We start walking down this, we got a seven mile hike back, ended up being like 12 to 15 because I didn't know where I was going. Look, here's the deal, man. When a, when a millennial doesn't have Google Maps, we don't know where we're going. So I'm literally walking. I don't know where I'm going. I, I, I know these truths. You find a stream, you stick with it. One, because there's fire. Two, because uh, it usually leads to a bigger place where you often park. So uh, yeah. Didn't have Google Maps. Frustrating. So I'm walking, and here's what I did. Every, every now and then, I would just look back, and I'd count the flashlights. Couldn't see them, but I'd count the flashlights, right? Smoke was just covering us, and I'm like, man, like, I literally have a kid who has asthma in, in my group, and I'm like, like, literally, in this situation, it's funny now looking back on it because we're all alive, but looking back on it, man, like, really difficult situation, really struggling. And, uh, man, I didn't know what to do. I'm serious, but I, I got to be honest with you. Like, this is what I think sometimes in our life we this is how we live. I think sometimes we are engulfed in smoke. And I'm not joking. You can ask my wife. This is like a dangerous reservation. It's uh, the largest reservation for bison in America, which are really dangerous animals. If you don't know, there's cougars everywhere. There's rattlesnakes everywhere. Like super dangerous area to be. Probably not the smartest decision I've ever made. Paul and Alethea, don't take the kids to something like this. But does it not feel like sometimes in your life, you're literally walking through clouds of smoke. You don't have a clue where you're going. You don't know where you're going. You don't know where your next step needs to be. You can't see anything around you. There's literally wild animals around you willing to attack and eat and destroy you. And you're walking through this and knowing this. Parents, come on. You got five behind you. You got the responsibility of not only taking care of yourself through the smoke, but you got to lead your family through the smoke. That's not easy. And it's in that moments that I think we come to these kind of passages and we just simply say, God, you're in control. I don't know where to step because I can't see. I can't protect me because I can't see what's around me. And I definitely can't lead them. And it's kind of in these moments that I think we almost put on our lights, on our front and our back as a church. And we look at Jesus and we just simply say, lead us. Guide me through the smoke protect me in the smoke. I don't know where I'm going and I don't know how to get through it, but master, you're the one who created the heavens and the earth. Lead me through it. So I love why he says in verse 29, and now Lord, consider their threats, which is essentially this. Look at the smoke. Look at the animals. Look at everything that is around you that is fighting against you, consider their threats and look at their request and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. I love that. And here's here's why I think it's really important. They don't say consider their threats and help us to figure out a way around it, right? Like you almost think that these disciples, after experiencing this trial with the people that killed their savior, Jesus, do you think that they would kind of come back and go, okay, Maybe we can build a church and put some walls around it so that it would protect us from the people coming in, right? It sounds kind of logical. Or maybe we can uh, figure out a way to go through the nations where the leaders and the Romans won't hear us and they won't know what we're saying so that they won't hurt us. But they don't say that. They say, consider all the threats and then give us boldness to preach in the midst of them. Man. You look at everything going on in your life right now. You look at everything you're facing and you ask God this, my master, my king, my Lord, see everything that I'm struggling with and help me to show Jesus in the midst of it. 
Help me to be Jesus in the midst of it. What a bold prayer. What a bold prayer that, that sets me aside and puts Jesus in the front. It's such a humble prayer. It's not a prideful prayer. It's not take this temptation away from me only. It's not take these struggles away from me. It's not take this trial away from me. It's that, man, God, be seen in the midst of it. I challenged you last week, just be faithful. Just be faithful in the valleys. Just be faithful in the mountaintops. When we're faithful in the valleys and the mountaintops, we preach Jesus through our life. Would you go to the Lord in every trial and every temptation and simply say, Master, my King, my God, my Lord, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth, and you see the trials that I face. You see the temptations I face before me. Help me to be bold in the midst of it and help me to preach the gospel in the midst of it. He continues in verse 30. It says, While you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And man, again, I, this is their default. I think it should become the default of your life. You think back on the Lord's prayer that he taught the disciples. You go back to him and it's like, Give us today our daily bread. And then it shifts to forgiveness. And I look at this and I'm like, I know what the Lord's Prayer is saying. It's saying, give us what we need in order to fulfill the mission you've given us. Give us what we need in order to do your will, right? Give us what we need. That's all we need to do what you've called us to do. And then forgive us. Bring salvation to us and to those around us. Let us forgive others and you forgive us. Like salvation come and give us what we need. And look at what they say. Lord, grant us what we need to preach with all boldness and then bring your salvation to the world. I love that. Like, it practically works itself out. It's not like a, a, a um, it's not cookie cutter, exactly what, what was said in the Lord's Prayer, but it's what they're facing right then in that moment. And you are facing something today. And you may ask yourself like this question, what do I do? Again, I love this idea. Instead of putting it into a first person or a second person, we put it in a third person. Jesus, what are you going to do? What is he going to do? What is my God going to do? Not what can I do, but God, what do you want me to do? Like it's all about you, not about me. Third person, not first person or second person. God, what you can do through me, not what I can do. And it says in verse 31 that when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken and They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. What happens when you pray to God? What happens when you're faithful in the valleys and the mountains? Look what happens when they pray. They're filled up with the Holy Spirit and they preach the word of God. Look, people don't live like Christ without the Holy Spirit in them. And so notice the order there. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and then they began to speak the word of God boldly. And remember back to when they first were sitting in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come to them. Isn't it interesting that the disciples already had the Holy Spirit in them, but after they prayed, the Holy Spirit filled them up that they might preach. I think there's sometimes in your life, and I would say in my life, where there's sometimes where you feel, and we use, often use this word, use, uh, maybe find a biblical word, insert it there, but we just feel empty. Sometimes I heard people say, we just feel dry. We just feel distant from God. We just feel like we're not really connected. We're not really pursuing after God. We just, sometimes we don't even feel like God's pursuing after us. We just kind of feel distant in those moments. And I think it's really cool that Luke points us back to this truth. The Holy Spirit filled Peter up, but he fills him up again. He comes back, like he's drawing us near. He's not leaving us. He's not forsaking us, but it's that recognition. It's that newness. It's that freshness. It's that revival. It's that coming back in our lives that makes us stand back up. It's not letting them consider their threats and sit down. It's God going, I see those threats. Let me show you what I can do. Like, man, that, come on, y'all. Like, when we see the threats around us and we don't know if we can move through them and we pray to God and he fills us up so that we might can do it. That is what's happening in this text. And so I go back to, uh, to Braylon and Carmen. Man, I, I love this couple. I'm so excited for this couple, but I challenged them with one thing. I said, I said, Braylon and Carmen, in your life, what I want you to do is I want you to teach me the gospel through your marriage. I want you to show me God's grace through your marriage. By the way you serve one another, by the way you outserve one another, I want you to show me the gospel. By the way, you extend grace and forgive each other. I want you to show me the gospel. In church, I'd say the same thing to you. I want you to show me the gospel in the valleys. I want you to show me the gospel in the mountaintops. When it feels good, when it feels bad. When you're struggling, when you feel like it's easy. I want you to show me the gospel. By the way, you extend grace to others in the valley. When you don't want to, 
When it's easier just to be angry because everyone else feels like they're angry at you, I want you to show me the gospel. Because when Jesus came, he came into the valley and he didn't fall into sin, he overcame. And Jesus is walking with you. So when you're walking in the midst of the smoke and when you're surrounded by wild beasts as Jesus was too, and when you feel like you got the weight of the world on your back and you've got to lead people into a place that you're scared to lead and it's difficult to lead, you can either say, I'm going to do this, me, or you can say, Master, King of the world who created all things, lead me. I'm going to ask for the band to come. We're going to close in worship. I have two gospel responses for you this morning. Man, I, ho- I, hoped you, I hope you are walking out of here pumped and ready to go, but I want to give you something practical to put in place. If you face a trial or a temptation, here's what I want you to do. Every trial you face, I want your first default position to be to go to prayer. So I want to just kind of be ringing in your head, like, man, walking through the smoke with the wild beasts around me and the responsibility behind me, my default is if I face a difficulty, I say, God, where are you leading me? Every trial that comes, God, where are you leading me? Every temptation you face, God, what are you doing? Let that be your default in your life. And you know what? This is going to be difficult and it's going to be painstaking and it's going to be a struggle in some cases.
have any questions about the sermon or would like to know more about following after Jesus, uh, please contact us and we would love to talk more about your relationship with Christ and how you can grow in your spiritual journey.